All right, another welcome here to the All In Podcast, where we talk about what it means to be all in in all areas of your life. And today we're at the All In headquarters here right outside Nashville. And today we're going to talk about what it means to be all in with your knowledge of the real estate market and how it affects you. And we got a very special guest today, Grant Hammond in the studio with us. And if you're from Nashville or anywhere around Nashville in terms of the real estate realm, you definitely know him. Uh, you've heard of this man. He is the real est- Nashville real estate market expert and condo guru. Um, I've known Grant for years, known of him before I ever met him. Uh, he has uh, a lot of expertise. He's got the inside connections uh, where he secures a lot of deals, does a lot of development on high end downtown condos, uh, developments. He's closed more than 500, half a billion dollars in real estate transactions since 02. And I'm sure that's gone up because this bio is maybe a year outdated and received about 40 real estate awards. So he's the founding member, uh, founding partner of Metropolitan Brokers. He's bought and sold several companies. In addition, he's participated uh, in several companies that dominate their respective fields. He's a big graduate of Auburn University. He's a family man, uh, lives here locally with his wife, his son, uh, plays local football with Grant Coach, helps coach, and their dog, Sophie. Grant, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. So let's jump right into it because I know Grant, a lot of people, I know you get, you get a lot of questions out there. And so first I want to, again, thank you for the time. Just to, you know, you come over here, you just came from some walkthroughs with some developments, but tell us a little bit about how you started uh, in real estate and what's kept you in it, you know, all these years. Yeah. Like, like most people, I didn't really go to college thinking I was going to become a real estate broker. Um, so I went to, to school, started in engineering, uh, until I got to thermodynamics and organic chemistry and learned very quickly that engineering was not for me. Uh, and so I washed out into the logistics program, which was sort of a, um, in between, uh, engineering and business school, um, took a bunch of accounting classes for an undergrad, uh, minor and, uh, continued with math classes and finished one math class short of a minor in math which is very useless. Uh, but, you know, you're, you're in college and mm-hmm. you don't really want to leave college. And so I spent a lot of time there. Um, first jobs outside of college were in the dot-com space. This was 1999, 2001 oh. area. This was the dot-com bubble at its best. Uh, and one of the companies we were involved with uh, was acquired. And uh, I sold out and had a little bit of money in my pocket and happened to be at a bar in Hillsborough Village called Sam's, which oh, yeah. d- doesn't exist, I don't think, yeah. anymore. Um, I sat next to a developer named John Coleman Hayes at the time, and he was the one that told me, you know what you really need to do is you need to get into real estate. Um, and we sat there and talked for an hour and a half, and I woke up the next day a little bit groggy, wasn't sure what happened that night before, put my pants on, I got a business card from John Coleman Hayes, it all came back. And um, so that Monday, I signed up for real estate school, and that was how I got into the business. And that was, you know, almost 22 years ago now. And so it's interesting because, I mean, you kind of came from an analytical background. You had your math and your accounting, and you were doing a lot of these things. And so for those out there that may be considering maybe a job in the real estate realm, I mean, oftentimes I think they think just sales is not for them. So talk about maybe what, how your personality even, because I, I think that's interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of different approaches to how you can sell something. It doesn't matter if it's cars or houses or whatever it might be. A lot of people can do it on personality and I can't. Uh, and so I have to do it based on analytics and math and trying to read the tea leaves and put some predictions out there and um, make sure that it's valuable to the community that I serve. That was what led me to start a blog uh, in the uh, mid 2000s, right before the crash, and um, or I should say the Great Recession. I yeah. don't know, we're using the yeah, word yeah. crash doesn't yeah. seem very PC right now. <laughs> right. Um, but and that blog was really what drove the majority of the first part of my business, and from there uh, was able to grow a portfolio of clients that okay. um, were more investment minded. And so right. I don't normally sell to the folks who want a $2 million house and care about paint colors and, you know, floor plans mm-hmm. and, and design and things of that nature. I care more. I, I sell more to people that care more about the numbers. You know, what's the future value of the home? Right. Why is it going to be that? Why is it not going to be that? Um, 
what areas of town have historically performed better than the other areas of town. Mm-hmm. So that's been my approach. And so I, I get a lot of the engineers and doctors and oh, yeah. uh, attorneys and folks like that. Okay. That's a good segue. Yeah, I know a lot of us know you as being the condo niche expert. Um, so at this point in your career, what's the mix of your business between, you know, buyers and sellers listings and, and, and representing buyers or your team or whatever? Well, if you're talking about the second half of 2022, it's, it's almost majority listings at mm-hmm. this point. I think a lot of people have moved, have shifted that way mm-hmm. as well, just based on the lack of buyers in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. But the way the reason I got into high rise condos to start with was, you know, one, the first buildings were just being built. Tony Gerontana was just starting mm-hmm. planning the Viridian, which I was a, this. Yeah. a venture together with the Novera Group. Um, and it was the very first residential high rise being built uh, in downtown. And, and it turns out it's really easy to analyze because it's the same floor plan on every floor. There's 10 floor plates. And um, you can really come up with a value of the 10th floor versus the 20th floor really, really easily. Right. Um, and depending on which side of the building, sunset, sunrise or sunset or what the view is, you can actually assign value to that. Right. And so I started to publish what I thought the future value of those condos would be based on their floor, their view and their floor plans. Uh, and then did it again for the Encore and for the Rhythm and for the Icon and for Terrazzo and all those first buildings that came up in Nashville. Yeah. And so just analyzed them as much yeah. as I could. And so built built a following that way. Do you remember back when, I mean, I remember working downtown, um, worked for in the bank footprint in the mortgage world. Um, and um, <clears throat> I can remember the CEO there who was longtime Nashville and he really didn't buy into the Nash to the condo scene. I mean, I don't know if you remember that, but like there were people that were, not sold that it was going to happen that you didn't have the infrastructure grocery whatever oh yeah that it just wasn't going to take off and like look at us now downtown didn't have any infrastructure right like if you wanted grocery it was the Next kroger on eighth avenue north right and then before the Viridian, you know before, before hg hill yeah. put in their grocery store in the bottom of the viridian which right. is now a different grocery store now right. but yeah it, there there really wasn't and for the first 10 years, there wasn't really good infrastructure. So wh- what happened at that time that you think, do you think it made people still like, well, the, like still make it happen, still come in? What was the allure? So was nationally, there was the reurbanization movement, right? Where, you know, during, after World War II, it was the suburbaniz- you know, suburbanization uh, where you wanted the white picket fence and the two kids and the dog and the car and you want to drive to work kind of thing. Well, that all reversed itself by the late 90s. And by the early 2000s, everyone was going back to the city. Nashville was actually late going back to the city. Um, Most of the other metro areas of similar sizes like Indianapolis and Charlotte had a huge jump on us. But Nashville had been really, really slow to. And the reason for that was because uh, until the late late 1980s, Nashville didn't have a residential code in downtown Nashville. You could only build uh, office or retail. Wow. So Bredesen was the one that changed that. Yep. Bredesen drew a box around downtown and said, Hey developers, if you want any incentives, this is the box in which I'll give it to you. And that's what created the Cumberland hotel that Tony Ger- hotel apartments that right. Tony Gerontani did. And that was that first residential high rise happened to be rental, right. uh, at the time. And so, uh, I think people forget that Tony Gerontani came from South Florida Mm-hmm. Um, to Nashville from the Styles Group and brought South Florida money with him and was able to do that deal. It wasn't done here locally. Yeah. Um, and so he really was the catalyst for that central business district um, redevelopment into a residential corridor. So that Fifth Avenue where he did Viridian and Cumberland and Benny Dillon was Benny soon Dillon's after there. Was, yeah. yeah, Benny Dillon. That was called like the residential avenue, if you will. Yeah. And now people have sort of forgotten about that because, yeah. you know, all the sort of the allure and sexiness has moved south. Right. Um, but that's where it all started. Yeah. And it yeah. was easy to analyze then. So let's get into kind of what, you know, I think what a lot of people want to know or what, what, what your thoughts are. But, you know, as far as what's your outlook now, you know, Powell spoke yesterday, um, you know, he's kind of going one way, you know, and, and the markets respond favorably. Uh, during the session and then the behind the closed doors minutes, 
come out and yeah. he's kind of country. Kinda... Well, then he had a press conference to answer questions and yeah. he just really just said, you know, he's backed up on all of it. He almost reversed it all crazy. right there. He's yeah. like, well, the pain's not over and we're, you know, don't expect it to end anytime soon and things yeah, like so that. So, what nature. does that mean for people like Grant? So, tell people, like, what does that mean for us? For when I say us, I mean you and I, yeah. anybody that's in this in this market. Yeah, why do we care? Huh? Yeah, why do we care? Like, what? Yeah, this the, the thousand foot view is why why we should care. Um, overall, um, Powell's mandate right now is to get inflation down to two percent, right? Which is extraordinarily difficult, and there's not really uh, a clear path to that. So, best guesses, right? And the best guesses right now is raising the the Fed funds rate, right? That's yeah. and, and not buying mortgage backed securities, trying to decrease the money supply a little bit. All that means, I mean, it gets really technical, but all that really means is that he wants to slow the economy down. He actually wants to hurt the average working person to slow down their spending, to slow down their income, to, you know, to raise the interest rates that they pay when they buy things uh, in, in an effort for them to consume less. Right. And if they consume less, then there's going to be a little more supply and then the supply can come down in price. And so it's, it's, it's pure supply, demand, economics. Uh, and the idea is he's actually hurting or slowing down really the middle class. Right. I and mean, it's really what it's aimed at. Um, and from his statements, I mean, when when they first made their statement, it was actually fairly positive, right? Yeah. And then during the press conference, uh, he really backed up on some of the things yeah. and and said, look, we've, I guess you can sort of um, take the conclusion that he's going to go at least halfway through 2023 with some more increases and a lot more hawkish. Uh, behaviors. And it's really um, based what I think on some flawed economics where he's looking at the jobs numbers right. and weighting that way higher than what I would rate it as. Yeah. And you mentioned that yesterday. It's an interesting point because, um, <clears throat> you know, during during these times where good times, you talked about how, you know, there's like uh, this, this phenomenon of people moving from, say, like a bartender um, I forget which phrase you called it, but yeah. like a bartender to a realtor or something like that. Yeah. But then maybe it doesn't work out, but you have all these people sucked out of the statistics in terms of what the counts are, almost like a census of like, hey, am I correct on that? Like uh, like how many people are in the force? But now if you suck those out, now the data is not there. And so that's what we're saying here is is perhaps wrong. So talk about that a little bit about kind of how you summarize yeah. that in your post on your IG post yesterday. So Powell said that, and he's, been sort of famous for saying this for the last quarter or so, that there's twice as many job openings than there are job applicants, right? And so that's one of the biggest thing he's waiting um, a lot of his decisions on, and mm -hmm. self-admittedly. And my fear and my sort of thought is that while those job openings are definitely there, they have been mostly vacated by people who have gone to take commissioned positions, yeah. not salaried positions. And so that could be realtors, car sales, um, roof representatives, plumbing supply representatives, people who whose income is solely dependent upon um, the sale of a commodity. Well, when the economy slows down significantly, which we're heading towards, um, then those folks will no longer earn commission, will need right. to go back to a salaried or an hourly position. My theory is that those positions will backfill very quickly. Um, and while since the commissioned folks are not counted in the number of people who are looking for a job, that number will stay the same, but the number of jobs will start to come down significantly. And we'll be at a one-to-one -one ratio, my estimate, by the end of uh, Q2 next year. Yeah. So like, you know, we've been taught, or at least that <clears throat> during this whole ride, that perhaps it's unemployment, you know, rising that would actually cause the Fed to start lowering rates. Right. And so how does that your, um, you know, your philosophy or your um, your take on it play in with that? Like, you know, if you have these people move back into the market, taking the jobs and then uh, but what does that do for unemployment or how do you see that? Playing? Yeah. So if he's tracking job openings and if this metric of having you know twice as many jobs as applicants um, is holding true for him, then when that comes down to a one to one ratio, he's got to stop raising rates and he's right. got to start with some more dovish um rhetoric because right. you know it, there's no other metric that he's really publicly saying that he's relying upon mm -hmm. um as much as that single job the job openings metric i mean it's yeah. mentioned in every press conference and every press release uh anytime he talks he's talking about jobs 
Um, if you remember four or five months ago, there was a great debate of, are we in a recession, right? Because yeah. Q, Q1 and Q2 were both negative GDP. And are we in a recession? And all the economics folks came out and said, no, because look at the jobs numbers. Uh, and then, of course, in, in Q3, it went up, but that was mostly based on a trade imbalance, had nothing right. to do with what we were actually creating or consuming, had everything to do with a trade imbalance. Right. So if you look at Q4 with the trade imbalance fixed, we're probably going to have negative GDP and the jobs numbers are going to start to come down. I think you can really safely say recession will be called at some point early to mid next year. Yeah. And it's interesting because you do have people, they're on both sides right now. I mean, and I, I mean, I don't think any of us truly know. All you can do is look historically, but, you know, the Fed, instead of looking to the future, it seems like that's all he's really doing, Jerome. And I don't know, you know, we, we hear these rankings like he may be the second or, you know, like the ranked presidents, you know, who's the worst or whatever, but not to get into that, but like, boy, it sounds like he is he's in like a tough maybe position. one of the worst. Yeah. Uh, but he made, he so, somewhat made his own bed, right? Yeah. So lowering that internal borrowing rate to zero and keeping it for there as oh, long yeah. as he did, that's the mistake is yes. keeping it there as long as he we did. We didn't need him that low for that long, did, did we? Did not. Yep. And yep. it was clear the housing market was frothy. The yep. auto sales market was hot, was frothy. Everything was too frothy. So he should have, yep. should have started this a little bit sooner. So we've got people out there, Grant, obviously that, I mean, there's buyers that are listening. There's, uh, there's agents that are maybe specialized with buyers. And then there's, you know, that they're li more listing heavy. So, I mean, what's the message that you think that the real estate community needs to hear? And then, um, what are, what's the message you think that, uh, you know, that, that buyers and sellers need to hear right now, as we move into next year, we've got, we've got elections coming up, uh, heading to the polls and, you know, May, that may election years rates. are usually good years for real estate market. I think this this year, this 2023 year is probably going to be uh, buck that trend, unfortunately. So people ask me all the time, is the market going to crash? Mm -hmm. um, and that depends on how you define, define crash. crash. Most people think of crash as the prices come way, way down. Um, I think it might be a little different this time. I think the activity is going to come way, way down with buyers really cocooning until interest rates do start falling. Uh, with sellers that have great equity in their homes, mm -hmm. um, with mortgage rates locked in in the two and a half to four percent range, cocooning. Mm -hmm. um, I like that. Yeah, I think I there's think a lot of cocooning. Right I think now. there's a lot of cocooning mm -hmm. happening there uh, until rates drop to the point where it starts to make a little bit more sense. Because mm -hmm. I think st uh, sellers will be very stubborn with their price and not want to give back a ton of what they virtually have made over the last twenty four months. Uh, I think the supply. Uh, also does not catch up to where it would need to be. Part of that is that builders are going to start slowing down and we're already starting to see that fewer and fewer permits being pulled. Um, but I also think there's going to be fewer and fewer resales that come yeah. on the market as well. Um, as again, like all of the things that cause people to sell houses, right? Death, that's going to continue. Yeah. So that's still out there. Divorce, that's going to continue and still Job be out change. there. Job change doesn't matter as much anymore because so it's many of these the jobs can telecommute. Yep. And, it, and it's at all levels of middle management to senior management, and maybe you only gotta have to go to the office mm -hmm. once or twice a week. It's a lot easier to stay put in your house mm -hmm. rather than have to move from here to Tulsa, Oklahoma, oh, yeah. uh, and show up five days a week in the office. So I think the jobs piece of it, I think employers are cognizant of that, are not gonna require folks to come into the office immediately. Therefore, I think the houses are going mm -hmm. to be fewer and fewer for sale at that point. So it's a smaller pie. I think a smaller so, pie. And so what can... Um, but smaller pie means prices hold, right, hold. Firmer, firmer than they would have otherwise. And I'm not saying they're going to stay where they are now. They're certainly going to give back a little ground. But when people say crash, they think of the Great Recession, prices going down 30 40%. No way on God's green earth that happens. Yeah. And so, yeah. And what makes you say that? Because that's, I think that's what some side, you know, there's the, there's a the side that's, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, it uh, doesn't have the urgency. So what caused it and during the Great Recession is very different than what caused it now, right? So if you look at subprime mortgages, mm -hmm. I mean, there's still some subprime mortgages being done, but it is not nearly to the degree that they were in 05, 06, right. uh, 04. I mean, I love the old, like that Florida example where there was the exotic dancer who'd owned five houses in that one neighborhood on no doc loans. Right. Um, it was on, I think, 60 Minutes or something yeah. back then. Um, but none of that stuff is happening now, right. right? So the fundamentals are all better. The underlying um, assets also have equity in them at the moment. 
And so if someone does get in trouble, divorce, death, um, job loss, whatever yeah. it might be, and has to sell, well, you can reduce the price and sell, but I don't think the neighbor next door to you goes, oh yeah, I'd like that new lower price. I'm going to try selling. Right. So I think speculative selling comes to a complete stop by the end of this year. And it almost has, but I still see them out there. Right, once right. So it's, I think it's a psychological shift for sellers, right? And how long is. does that normally take, do you think, for it to settle in the, what we might call the new norm? at least the new temporary norm, right? For this, for this 2023, which almost dis- you're almost describing like, um, like in better's terms, almost like a push, you know, or a tie, you know, you're kind of just pushing it down the tracks, not a huge loss. And I know we're in a, in a sub market here that's remained strong historically. Nashville, we're not a coastal, right. we're not a coastal town. So we're not, we're not, in Cal- we're not California. We're not, we're not uh, South Florida. And we're not uh, Upper East Coast or, or whatever. So yeah, we're not Rust Belt. Rust right. Belt might get hurt kind of yeah. in this, but we're not really talking about Nashville here. And a lot of people use Tennessee. Vegas as the kind of like this. And I don't know that I agree with that, like uh, as some sort of a benchmark, because yeah. a lot of times get hammered first. Um, and there's a lot of people, and I know I'm sure you do. You know, people in the Vegas market, and uh, it's really almost who you talk to. I mean, people think that because prices are coming down that that means a crash. And so maybe just for the listeners, because I think uh, I would love to hear, but like, what would be your definition, you know, as of a crash? Like, you know, when... Yeah, crash for me is losing 25% of the value. And then how how fast is that? Define? Over any period of time. Yeah. Could be a slow crash, fast crash. That's mm-hmm. a crash for me. Okay. You lose 25% of your value. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people would probably feel similarly about that, that you lose a quarter of the value. That's pretty painful. But not going to happen this time around in middle Tennessee. That's for sure. And so people go in into 2023, they may have to move. Um, I mean, what kind of thoughts should they have right now as they embark on that? Maybe they've got a job opportunity or something on the horizon, unfortunate divorce or death or that may occur. Then what happens? So um, how do you, how do you coach your clients through that or your team, you know, to, 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 to talk with, with these folks. Yeah. If, if you need to sell quickly, you, you have to underprice the comps, right? It's the exact opposite of what it's been for the last two years, where if your neighbor sold for 400,000, you list for 410 and then the next one lists for 420, the yeah. next one lists for have 440. Have an open house and 30 cars in the street. Yeah. And, and have, you know, I'm I had, doing that anymore, right? <laughs> I know I had one listing um, that we overpriced and got 42 offers on. Yeah. And that's why I looked at Brian Merrill, my partner and yeah. said, this is this is the peak. This right. is it. This is the absolute height of this thing. The speculation is starting yeah. to come. Yeah, yeah, and that that was the uh, the very the end of last year yeah. for sure. And it's been a fluttering back down since. But you do the opposite. So if your neighbor sold for four hundred thousand, you know, a month ago, you're you're pricing more like three ninety. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And so you've just you've unfortunately got to price underprice the competition to sell if you need to sell quickly. Right. Um, and you got to do all the things that we used to do back in our normal markets. Right. We've been in such an abnormal market for two and a half years that it's hard to, to remember that you've got a stage, you've got to take the best photos, you've got to, you know, listing it on a specific day on the MLS actually gets you more traffic than if you list it on other days and at yeah. specific times, like you've got to go back to that knowledge of the marketplace uh, and use all those tips and tricks in order to make sure that you give yourself the best chance to sell. No doubt, no doubt. What do, um, uh, what does it look like for, for renters though, moving into 2023? I mean, uh, how do we look uh, rank nationally and then rent increases. Do you see that happening? It's got to plateau at some point, right? So you can't slow the economy down and continue to increase rents. Nashville has had a huge rental uptick over the yep. last, you know, 18 months. Um, and I own several rental properties and I'm starting to have more conversations with tenants about uh, when renewals come up and I say, well, I'm going to raise the rent by hundred dollars a month. And they're saying, well, you know, whereas, you know, six months ago, they're like, oh, is that all? Yeah. That's great. I'd love to do that. Right. And so, you see it from the tenant perspective too. Uh, I think we'll plateau in the increases and it'll be a very, very slow flutter back down. Um, we don't have an, a huge onslaught of rental properties at the moment mm-hmm. uh, because most of the properties that were purchased were purchased for personal um, use you know, as a primary residence. And so yeah. we don't see a ton flooding on the marketplace anytime soon. Yeah. Um, so that's another reason why I don't think prices on sale for sale property is going to come down very much because you can easily rent that property and cover your, you know, whatever your payment is on your 4% mortgage. Yeah. Um, so you may keep that house, move to Tulsa and rent there for a while. So, you know, a lot of information out there. Um, you're obviously an avid reader. 
Freakonomics, one of your great um, yeah, I love those guys. those guys. But now there's you know people are getting bombarded with information. You know you've you've got no shortage in 20, 30 seconds you could scroll through and maybe stop on five, ten different people to have that are opining about what's what's happening out there. Who who should in your opinion people listen to that perhaps uh, you know that that would maybe give solid info out there that's not going to be you know just trying to get because I mean you watch CNBC and sorry but um, you know it, it seems like it's always negative um, and it's you know there was this there was this one person that uh, uh, a a, 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 a um, reporter who's on CNBC dying of something or other. And Barry Habib was talking about all the way back to like 2017, she had been, you know, calling for you to sell, <laughs> you know, don't get in the market. It's going to be a crash. Yeah. And then, you know, if you had a $300,000 house back at that point, now it'd be worth 550. And so obviously she's been wrong. And, but that's, it's, it's hard because you just think CNBC, Hey, it's, you know, you're, you're in America. Why not just watch that? But like, it's not that easy, is it? It's almost like watching Jim Cramer of mad money, you know, yeah. Uh, he's, he's like a broken clock. It's, it's right twice, you know, every day. Um, <laughs> and so if you keep saying the same thing over and over again, you're, yeah, you're eventually, you're right. You're right. right, right. Um, that's for sure. Uh, for me, I listen to non-industry economists. Yeah. So if it's an economist who is, um, within the real estate industry, I typically discount what they say. Yeah. Um, even though I love, uh, Charles Young, mm-hmm. I think he does a, fabulous job and he's very fun to listen to um he's also usually a little bit over optimistic who's somebody that you uh, outside of the industry that you go to? for me the bow tie economist okay that's the way that he likes to be known the so, bow tie economist, the bow tie right. economist. you heard it here folks <laughs> by the way this might be a good time to say if you are um watching this go ahead and hit the subscribe button on uh youtube and uh but we're gonna have a few more minutes with grant so new agents you got a great brand i mean Everyone, and when, when, when I see you, I know exactly who you are. You know, you've got a style, you've got uh, a niche in the, in the, uh, in the condo market. What, um, how important is branding? Do you think? And, and maybe you came about it just by doing your thing and I didn't even have, and maybe it was not even intentional, but you know, I think on the outside looking in, we would say, Hey, you definitely got a brand. You've definitely got a niche. We know who you are and what you're about. Um, and then, you know, you've got the, 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 the most killer mustache <laughs> in the world, um, and a hat wearer like me, but like how, how do, uh, how do these folks that are getting into the industry or maybe they've been in the industry, they've just had it easy and now they're, um, kind of, it's, it's hard. So is branding important in that? Yeah. I think the biggest mistake new agents make is they become the biggest company cheerleaders on planet earth and it yeah. doesn't matter. And then, and to to their uh, credit, I suppose these companies are are trying to make these yeah. new agents into their own cheerleaders, and so you see that with all the big companies, everyone from Keller to Crylike to Compass and everyone else. And I'm always shocked by the number of people that don't have their own email address that they use the company email oh, wow. address. Sure, just absolutely shocked by that. Yeah, um, but you should definitely uh, you should definitely have a website that is not a company website. Yeah. Um, even if you don't use it, uh, and you should have an email associated with that website yeah. and you need to use that all the time, forward all of your company email to your, to that personal email and don't have it be a Gmail or a Yahoo, or I've, you know, I emailed an AOL, uh, yeah. agent yesterday and yeah. um, he's been in the business for 40, almost 40 years. And so that's excusable, but, <laughs> um, but the Gmails and the Yahoo's and stuff, get your own domain name. Um, what about the socials, you know, you, your own IG and how could people follow you there at Grant Hammond? Is that correct? Yeah. So actually, uh, on Facebook, mine's actually at Nashville, at Nashville, believe it or not, at Nashville. Isn't that nuts? How'd you do that? Uh, so what Facebook had a changeover, um, I don't remember how long ago, 12, 14 years ago, and you could choose your handle oh, wow. and it started, I think at like 1230 AM Nashville time. Uh, and that was like, what should I do? It should be Grant Hammond. And I was like, I'm gonna try Nashville and bang, got like it. Buying a concert ticket, yeah. lighting up, you know. That's exactly what it was. And so, but yeah, it should be your name, right? Because no one's going at Nashville to look for me. Yeah. That was in hindsight, that was dumb. But you know, but if people want to follow you, because again, guys, I mean, Grant really, all of us here in the Nashville area, and if even if you're not in the Nashville area, I mean, I would trust him uh, and his opinion. Um, cause the research he does, but like, what's the best way for people to, to, re- to find you, 
um, YouTube, Instagram, you know, if you Facebook. Just, if you just Google Grant Hammond, Grant you'll come Hammond. up with everything. Yeah. I think I've done a good job of flooding yeah. the search results with, with my stuff. <laughs> so what are the, what do these new agents need to do this year? Do you think, I mean, um, uh, this would be a good time to, uh, work on your branding and, and work on your craft. Um, New agents need to go take the four free classes at Real Tracks, okay. so you can become expert MLS users, and you'll be surprised at how useful that is. And they're free classes, yeah. so go take those four free classes at Real Tracks, uh, and then take additional education um, and become more valuable to your your new potential clients. They're going to be hard to come by, uh, and there's going to be a lot of folks who will contact you about listing. Yeah. Uh, and in the last six months, I've turned down more listings than I think I have in the last 10 years oh, wow. um, combined. And so, I mean, I'm turning down, I turned down a 38 unit development uh, last week. I turned down a 97 unit development two months ago um, because there's some unrealistic expectations on what those things are going to sell for. And, and plus banks are making it really difficult to build new construction right yeah. now for the development loan, the vertical loan. Um, the LTCs have gone from, you know, 75% down to 60% with most banks right now. Mm. Um, and some banks aren't even loaning money on new developments right now. Uh, yeah. Like First Bank said, you know what, we don't, we're just, we're done for this year. That's a big yeah. darn bank to say that. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and you're an investor like me, and mm -hmm. um, we know a lot of investors, so a lot of investors in our, in our audience. Um, do you, is this affecting investors more, do you think right now? Or... Um, you know, the end user, just someone that's buying, you know, the family that's buying a home, the person that's buying a home. It, it feels more like it's uh, across the board affecting everyone in, in a similar way. Investors are kind of on hold a little bit right now, unless they're... They are. I mean, the, we sell a lot of short-term rentals and Airbnbs in Nashville as well. Um, and we just had a new development sell last week and yep. we sold 90% of it in, yeah. in Which one, one was hour. that? That was called Raven. Raven, Raven near Oracle Development in East yep. Nashville. Uh, it's one of those, you know, four bed short term rentals with rooftops that have jacuzzis oh, cool. up there. Yeah, I've seen them. Um, and so those investors are still there because I don't feel like the wealthier group of Americans are really being hurt just mm -hmm. yet. Um, they did, you know, their stock market and their 401k holdings have certainly been hurt. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those guys are smart enough to jump out of the market and now they're into. Uh, where do I put the cash now yeah. type mode and they can get three and a half percent in their money market account or 4%. And that's kind of exciting, not exciting. And so mm -hmm. some of those are jumping in real estate as a uh, long-term hold play. Yeah. I mean, in Nashville always, I mean, we feel like has uh, historically been great. And I think, you know, we're only getting started. I mean, I think, I mean, I've been here all my life, native Nashvilleian, and I still remember when the Titans came and now, I mean, heck there's a, it's it's odd to be a, a native like you know most people think oh um you're obviously from somewhere else but i mean as we move forward um do you think that it's gonna it's gonna get to a point where um you know it, mid year or something like that like if these rates are where they're at now i guess this is my question is is uh is these people that are buying say condos uh short term rentals uh, are you seeing more people sort of price out of the cash flow when they're running their numbers just because rates are higher? Or you thinking people are just ponying up more down payment uh, or maybe pulling money from somewhere else and paying cash? Yeah, on the pure investment uh, side, it has hit a ceiling. So rates have affected the calculation. So if you're running your cap rates or an IRR calculation, it definitely has affected that calculation. Right. Um, so the best time to sell statistically, the best time to sell an investment property was this past March. Right. <laughs> um, so March was the, um, the, the highest, um, sort of in price over ask yeah. price for an investment <clears throat> property. So they were being bid up 200, $250,000. Oh yeah. Um, now you're getting par, right. You're getting what you ask for. Yeah. And uh, so that's kind of a big change from March until, uh, and October, I think some people November. like, are just staying on the market. Uh, like when we had one and, uh, you know, Renter was coming out in East Nashville. Um, you know, it's time. You know, we're going to roll it into something else, maybe commercial, and uh, just missed it. I mean, it was May, June, May. They moved out the end of May, and you know, yeah. price reduction, and then still no action. We're like, hey, we're just going to put turn it back renting again. So it definitely makes it makes a difference. But, but man, thanks so much. This has yeah. been amazing. Um, you've got a lot of things going. You're super busy, and again, guys, uh, follow Grant. Reach out to him. Um, he is huge in development. He just came from a bunch of walkthroughs today. 
And if I know if I were buying a condo or investing or any, if I just wanted to know anything about what's going on, this is the guy. So, so Grant, thanks again. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, appreciate it. All right, Mark. All right, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, once again, Grant Hammond was here. Uh, we really appreciate him. If you have any questions, feel free to drop some down below and we'll get back to you. As always, thank you for tuning in to the All In Podcast.